Good evening. Comets have been very much in the news, and Comet Hayakutake really has come up to expectations. You can see it now after dark, in the evening sky, below the pole star and over to the left. And there's a lovely picture taken by Michael Maunda. You can see there the bright, rather fuzzy head and the long tail. And here's a photograph taken in America by Kent Blackwell. And you can see from that that the comet really is decidedly green. And green comets are unusual. This is the greenest that I've ever seen. Well, it's going to be there for some time. Throughout much of April, it will be there in the evening sky after sunset, and it should be very spectacular. Of course, at the moment, the moon's getting in the way, but um, it won't be there after a few, few more nights. And I'm glad to say that on the night of April the 3rd, 4th, just after midnight on the 4th, there's going to be an eclipse of the moon. When the moon passes into the Earth's shadow, and for an hour or so, the moonlight's virtually cut off, and therefore the sky is going to darken, and that's going to be a very good chance to see the comet. So let's hope for clear skies that night. The Hubble Space Telescope continues to astound us. Look at this picture. This is the first picture ever taken of surface detail on the remote planet Pluto, which, bear in mind, is smaller than our moon and a very long way away. And we even have a map of the surface, and that is totally beyond any ground-based telescope. It just shows how powerful the Hubble telescope actually is. But this evening, I want to go way beyond Pluto, way beyond the comet even, right beyond the solar system. Most stars, including our sun, luckily for us, shine steadily for year after year, century after century. But now and then, something unusual happens. I will remember that one evening in 1975, I went out after dark to make some routine observations, and I looked at the constellation of Cygnus, the swan, and there was something very strange about it. There was a bright star where no star had been before. It hadn't been there the previous night. And I realized what it was. It's what we call a nova. I promptly telephoned the Royal Observatory and said, you do know, don't you? I said, yes, it was discovered this afternoon by a Japanese astronomer. It gets dark earlier in Japan than it does here. It didn't last for long, but while it was there, it altered the entire aspect of that part of the sky. And bright novae are not very common. There was one in 1918, a bit before my time, in the constellation of Aquila, the eagle, and that, in fact, became so bright, for temporarily, it outshone every star in the sky apart from Sirius. But it didn't last, it faded away, and has now become a very faint telescopic object, and that's how it is now. Now, the word nova means new, but actually a nova is not really a new star at all. What happens is that a very faint star, the fainter member of a binary or two-star system, suffers a tremendous outburst and flares up to many hundreds or thousands of times its normal luminosity, remaining bright for a few days, a few weeks, occasionally a few months, before fading back to obscurity. Well, at this stage, um, I'm delighted to welcome back Professor Michael Bode from the Liverpool John Moores University. Mike, first of all, what exactly is a nova? Well, the two stars you've mentioned so far, Nova Cygni 1975 and Nova Aquilae 1918, are members of the class of classical novae. These are stars that brighten by maybe 100,000 times in a space of a day and have outbursts every 10,000 to 100,000 years or so. Now, sometimes when we talk about novae, classical novae, these are confused with supernovae. Mm. Uh, supernovae are very different beasts. Um, they have one outburst. It's the catastrophic death of a star. And here we see the remnant of the outburst of a supernova in AD 1054 that gives rise now to this remnant, the Crab Nebula, in the constellation of Taurus. So they're one-offs, much more luminous even than classical novae. Yeah. At the other end of the scale, we have dwarf novae. And one of the most uh, well-known of these is SS Cygni. And here we see the so-called light curve of SS Cygni. You can see that the outbursts here are uh, much more frequent. Uh, these are occurring on weeks time scales, and they're much lower amplitude. In fact, if we look over many years, we see many, many of these outbursts. Not absolutely periodic, but every few weeks or so, there's, there's an outburst of SS Cygni, so much lower amplitude than classical novae. What exactly are the main characteristics of classical novae? Well, we've mentioned the very rapid rise that these have to, to maximum, and if we look at the visual light curve of a classical nova, you can see that there's a very rapid rise, and then an initial decline, which defines the so-called speed class of a nova. The more rapid that decline, the faster the nova. And this particular nova, DQ Hercules, that went off in 1934, was a slow to moderate speed nova. Um, we have seen 
around 300 novae have been observed in some detail. And if we look at uh, faster novae, for example, Nova Aquilae, 1927, the initial decline is more rapid. And then we go on to CP Lac, uh, which went off in 1936. And this is declining away even more rapidly uh, still. One of the other defining characteristics of a classical nova outburst, as opposed to a dwarf nova, for example, is that it throws off huge amounts of material into interstellar space. Something like uh, 10 times or more the mass of the Earth is thrown off uh, at outburst into the interstellar, interstellar medium at velocities of 1,000 kilometers per second or more. And here we see a sequence of pictures of the expanding remnant of nova GK Persei, which is an over that exploded in 1901, uh, a sequence from 1917 up to the late 1970s. And you can see uh, how the ejecta are, are spreading out and becoming rather more clumpy with time. The next picture actually shows the remnant just a couple of years ago. And you can see this truly looks like an explosion. This was a very fast nova, one of the brightest this century. Well, you mentioned DQ Hercules 1934. It was, I remember that nova very well indeed. Yes. Here's a picture of the area before the nova flared up. And here's the same area with the nova maximum. And then, of course, it faded away again. It has now become very faint. The one stage I remember, it was strongly green in color. It was still there, but I've dipped the telescopic object now. Right. And it was, in fact, a very interesting nova indeed. Yes, that's right. It's interesting to us in, in many ways. If you look at the light curve of this nova in uh, 1934, you'll notice after that initial decline, it actually underwent a very much more rapid decline when it was about three and a half magnitudes below peak. It dipped considerably and then recovered again. At the time, this was not understood. And until uh, the 1960s into the 90, early 1970s, we really didn't understand what caused that dip. More fundamentally, until around the same time, we didn't truly understand what gave rise to the Nova outburst at all. Well, you may not have known that, but at least you did realize that Novi were important. And why was that? Well, that's right. Novi were seen as being important for several reasons, one of which was that they were seen to be spreading out material enriched in heavier elements, such as carbon and nitrogen and so on, into the interstellar medium. But also, they uh, were seen in external galaxies, Edwin Hubble in the 1920s observed classical novae in the Andromeda spiral, for example. Two million light years away. That's right. But um, his work was followed by several others, including Halton Arp in the 1950s. And it soon became apparent that the faster the nova, the brighter it was intrinsically. Uh, in fact, if we, if we look at a plot of that, uh, we can see how tight this relationship is, relatively tight this relationship is, and it's become known as Arp's relation. You can plot uh, the brightness, the uh, apparent magnitude of the novae in M31 at peak against the log of the time it takes to decline by uh, two magnitudes, the speed of decline essentially along the bottom there, and there's a relatively tight relationship between the two. This means mm -hmm. that if you follow a nova through the first few magnitudes of decline and you get its speed class, then you can infer something about how bright it is intrinsically knowing how bright it is intrinsically with how bright it, it appears to you gives you an idea of how far away it is and therefore novae were used as distance indicators in our local group of galaxies. So you've learnt more now about the kinds of stars that novae actually are. That's right. The real revolution in understanding what uh, novae, uh, what causes the explosions of classical novae came about, as I said before, around the 1960s. In the mid-50s, observations of several stars, the, the remnants, the central remnants of classical novae, uh, were undertaken. Uh, one of the first of these was by Walker. And here we see a light curve taken over just uh, a few hours of DQ Hercules. And what we see there are periodic dips in the light curve. And essentially, this is due to eclipsing of a hot object by a cool object. It was an eclipsing binary star. At the time it was discovered in 1954, it was shown to be the shortest period eclipsing binary. That means that the two stars in this binary are very close together. And here we see an artist's impression of this binary system. There's a cool star, which is uh, a few tenths uh, the radius of, of the sun in very close proximity to a white dwarf star, a very compact star. 
Now, material is actually being dragged off the outer layers of the larger star uh, and is falling via an accretion disk onto the surface of the white dwarf star. As it impacts that disk, it leads to a bright spot that we see in the image here. But material is gradually building up. Hydrogen-rich material is gradually building up on the surface of that white dwarf until conditions are such that a runaway nuclear explosion occurs. The accreted material, and maybe a little bit more, a little bit less, is ejected at velocities of 1,000 kilometers per second or more. And the whole system brightens considerably, and we see a nova in the sky. Well, we can see the increase in light, but what about observing novae in other wavelengths, from the very short to the very long? This is where the other part of the revolution occurred. Um, around 1970, particularly, uh, we were able to observe at uh, wavelengths across the electromagnetic spectrum. And uh, one of the first novae to be observed in this way was Nova Serpentis 1970, FH Sur. And here we see, first of all, the visual light curve, and it looked very much like DQ Herculis. Had a, a fairly gentle decline initially, then a very rapid drop and a recovery. When the object was observed in the ultraviolet, and the ultraviolet uh, luminosity was added to the visual luminosity, it was realized that the uh, combination of these two was constant. Visual plus ultraviolet was constant. And this was a prediction of the um, thermonuclear runaway model that I just mentioned of the outbursts of Novi. So that tied in. That uh, tended to confirm that model. When we looked in the infrared from the ground, um, we saw, coincident with the visual light curve drop, a tremendous rise in infrared radiation. This is consistent with emission from uh, dust grains, submicron sized dust grains, formed in the ejector of Nova Serpentis 1970. What happens is when the ejector gets to a certain distance, dust condenses out, it fogs out the central star which dims, that absorbed radiation is re-radiated in the infrared and the infrared goes up and then as the dust mm. cloud thins out, um, the infrared dies away and the visual light recovers. So now we understood what, what that tremendous dip in DQ Herculis was, was due to. Uh, later on, we also see the radio flux rise as the ionized gas shell spreads out and then decay away some years later. What are the main puzzles remaining? Well, what we're doing now is to look in great detail at the remnants of Novi, and we're particularly interested in, in, in the shaping of those remnants. And we're taking a two-pronged approach. One is to look uh, at remnants in very early stages of their evolution. And, of course, we need to employ very high spatial resolution imaging. And one way to do that is to use the Merlin uh, array, radio array, based around the Lovell telescope at Jodrell Bank. And we've observed Novi from just a couple of months after outburst, such as Nova Cygni 1992, um, up till about a year after outburst. And when we look through uh, this sequence of images, we see the remnant growing, as you would expect. And then we see uh, a, a great range of shape occurring, that the remnant actually has a lot of structure to it. Now, we're, we're trying to understand uh, the structure, and we're trying to relate this to the structure we also see in Hubble Space Telescope at optical wavelengths. And there is, there's some pro problem here of uh, relating the two. But to help us to understand the shaping of remnants, we're also looking at much older remnants, such as that of DQ Herculis. And we're observing these from the ground using telescopes such as the William Herschel telescopes. And it's a program undertaken by my colleagues Tim O'Brien and Andy Slavin at JMU. And we've observed several remnants including that of DQ Herculis, the nova that uh, yes. we were mentioning earlier on. Yes. And here is a very striking image of that particular nova remnant. And you can see this remnant uh, is uh, very complex in, in its structure. You can see not only the shell, but also tails of material extending beyond the shell itself. Now, in exploring this, uh, we've used a technique that selects out images at particular wavelengths and by doing this, we can actually step through the nebula. Because if you uh, can think about it, you would uh, realize that 
Um, material that's moving towards you is, is blue shifted and material that's moving away is red shifted and therefore by selecting particular wavelengths you can step through the nebula and that's what we're, we're doing here. And we've gradually formed a picture of the nebula of DQ Her um, which we've called the Maggot Nebula of DQ Hercules. I hate that name. <laughs> <laughs> we realized that uh, the DQ Her Nebula comprises an equatorial ring and tropical rings and also these tails. Now they seem to extend back to blobs of material in the shell and it's perhaps a fast wind that's blowing past um, clumps of material that's giving rise to those tails. We've also observed several other remnants from the ground and here we can see uh, the remnant of Nova Cygni 1975 as it appears now and this is the Nova that you mentioned right at the beginning. But what we have coming up is uh, the exciting prospect of observing Nova remnants using the Hubble Space Telescope. We have time on the, the HST starting in July and we expect to obtain images uh, of the clarity and detail of, as the one of GK Per that you see here of remnants such as Nova Sig 1975 which other, otherwise shows not too much structure when you see it from the ground. And what we're trying to do is to relate the overall structure to other characteristics of these novae such as their speed class. We expect the faster novae to be less shaped than the slower novae such as DQ Her. Well, certainly there's a great deal going on, but I gather that um, you personally have an exciting time ahead in Nova research. Yes, we do. We've just been funded to build the Liverpool Telescope, which will be based uh, in the Canary Isles and should be operational by 1999. And that telescope is designed specifically to undertake astronomy, uh, which is related to observing objects such as novae, supernovae, and comets that are unpredictable phenomena and not only to get onto those quickly, but also to observe them systematically over a long period of time. So that by observing in that way, we should be able to understand a lot more about what is physically occurring in those objects. Well, one thing is quite definite. Our sun is not going to turn into a nova. It's not that kind of star, so we're quite safe there. That's certainly true. What we now need, of course, is a really good bright nova. It hasn't been one for some time. I think we're overdue for one. And if that one does come along, it may well be discovered by an amateur, because amateurs have a great record of nova discovery, and they do know the sky so well. So let's hope we have a really good nova in the foreseeable future. Mike, thank you very much. Thank you. Now, it's, um, it's newsletter time. Therefore, if you want your new newsletter, then send your stamp for envelope to newsletter number 61, The Sky at Night, BBC TV, London W1270S. You can, of course, dial up our information line, 0891 8 or you can call up CFAX on page 615. Now, when I come back next month, um, we're going to go a long way away again. Uh, Ian Nichols is going to join me, and we're going to discuss the end of the universe, which I'm glad to say is a long way ahead yet, but must come, I suppose, one day. But uh, meanwhile, don't forget Comet Hayakataki. It's going to be there for much of April, Beautifully hanging, I think, in the evening sky. Clouds permitting, you'll see it there, with a bright head and a long tail. And remember, it is the brightest comet for a very long time. And uh, above all, don't forget that lunar eclipse on the night of April the 3rd, 4th, because that's going to be a very good time indeed to see the comet. So until next month, good night.